First things first, all of this needs to go into there. A bit like putting trash in a dumpster, really. First, I need to pack some lube into the axle holes. This is probably too much, but you know, it's good enough. I have a plan, let's do it while I'm underneath it. Drop it just a tiny bit. I'll catch it with the sheer strength of my back. There. Now to get underneath the car and secure the things. Now to add the gearbox oil before I forget. Now to hook up the wires on the generator. Choke cable. Throttle cable. Grounding strap installed. You may remember to get this drivetrain out, I had to cut the shift lever because it was a bit jammed and it was easier to cut it than to figure out a way to slip the linkage off of the end of the tube. Well, this meant I had to order a new shift lever, and here it is here. Now, if you recall from the last episode, I said Ed, my parts getter guy from Hungary, brought most of these Trabant parts on the plane with him on, on vacation from Hungary to Dallas. Well, this shift lever is a bit long for a normal suitcase, so he carried it on the plane with him, as if it was some sort of hideously skinny cane or something. But just to show how much personality this new Trabant shift lever has. Here's some photos that Ed took at the airport. First step is to pull out the old shift lever, what's left of it. Then insert the new one. Shifter linkage in place. Speedometer drive. Clutch cable. This is not hard at all. Well, this is gonna be extremely difficult, but very, very interesting. I need that assistant. And now that the exhaust and pretty much everything else is in place, it's time to tackle the ignition using my fancy new contactless Zündung für Trabant, or contactless ignition for the Trabant my fancy new electronic ignition system I got for six volt cars. Step one on that is to find top dead center on cylinder number one using this dial gauge setup here. And also finding four millimeters before top dead center because that's where you actually want the firing bit to happen. Just crank the cylinder over until you hit top and it starts backing down. Wait, that was it. There's top dead center, let me mark it on the pulley. Next, I need to rotate it backwards four millimeters or about one and a half revolutions on this imperial dial. And mark that as four millimeters BTDC. You can see how the mark on the pulley lines up with the mark I put on the engine block here. And this one up here is top dead center. Install the six volt battery back into place. I have all the wires hooked up and the timing set, and I can just show you briefly how that works. This is cylinder two's mark right here, and when it lines up with the four millimeters before top dead center mark on the crankcase here, this LED should go off, indicating it fired, like so. And if I rotate it all the way around, or 180 degrees, which is kind of hard to do because the 
spark plugs are in place and there's compression. When this mark comes up, the LED light will turn on, indicating cylinder one is fired. Boom, like that. This was actually extremely easy to set up and far easier than I was expecting. Now this electronic ignition is great and it's easy and it's simple to use and it'll probably last forever. And there's no points to adjust and there's no contacting and all these other benefits, but it does have two disadvantages over the mechanical ignition that was in the Trabant. For one, cylinders one and two can be slightly out of phase because the Trabant's crankshaft is pressed together. The mechanical ignition had a way to compensate for that and you could slightly vary the timing between cylinders one and two. This one has two magnets on a ring that are a set distance apart and whatever you set on cylinder one is gonna be what you get on cylinder two as well. So that's a small downside. Another small downside is that this has no mechanical advance mechanism like the other one. The other one had a centrifugal advance in the middle that would retard the timing when the engine was going slow and advance it when it was going faster. This is just set at a constant rate through the entire rev range of the engine. So just things to point out. I'm not really bothered by either of them, but there, there are two disadvantages. All right, the sparky bits are all timed and set up and everything, and everything else is set up and hooked up and mounted and so on and so forth. So I think the next step is to try to start the engine. I mean, I need to get some gas first, but I, I think it's about time we see if this engine roars to life. I hope I haven't forgotten anything. Add some go-go juice. Pre-mixed, of course, I'll use a 50 to one ratio. Put the engine blanket back in place. Air filter, and yes, I did repaint most of these parts just for giggles. Put the face back in place. That carburetor's dripping something awful. I'm thinking the float's stuck. Take the face back out. Yeah, it's just flowing in there with a, uh, yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. You know what? Forget it, I'm getting too anxious. I'm going to try to start the turbine anyway with whatever residual is in that carburetor. I had to shut the fuel off because it's leaking, but I want to hear it run if it will. So let's just, let's just go at it. All right, do I choke it? Does it matter? Let's try it. It sounds completely different cranking over, completely different. Come on. Just open the throttle. Doesn't sound like anything's happening. Again, it sounds completely different than it did before. I can't stress that enough. All right, I've checked some things out. I checked the compression in both cylinders, it's good. I checked that both cylinders are sparking. I'm not entirely sure that the timing's correct yet, but I'm just one person. I've replaced the float valve on the carburetor because it wasn't sealing properly and causing gas to dump everywhere. And I happen to have an old carburetor with a perfectly good float needle in it. So I put that in there and that's good. What I'm gonna do now is put a little bit of oily gas in the tops of the cylinders and just let it sit there for a little bit. And I'm gonna try to start it again. Put the spark plugs back in and give it a crank and see if it'll start this time. Probably won't. I don't know why, but it just probably won't. All right, here we go. Will it run? Probably not. Let's choke it just for funsies. Whoa, it sparked. It sparked. I'm gonna try it this harder. Oh, it's getting close. Oh, I'm starting to vibrate. Holy crap. Yes! Yes! Let's open the door. Lest I die of communist insul inhalation. <laughs> it runs! And listen to it! I am ecstatic right now. The hair is just standing up on my head. Yes! Listen to it! The idol's way too high, obviously. 
Let's give it a little bit of a choke. It sounds brilliant! Oh my god. Listen to it! <laughs> I'm so happy right now. All right, I do need to shut it off because I'm inside. <laughs> it ran! It ran! Right, it's raining outside, but I'm too excited to wait until tomorrow for a test drive. So we're going now. I've idled it all the way down. Maybe a little too much. I should probably turn the gas on. All right, let's put it in reverse, assuming I can. That's not reverse. This is. Whoa. The steering wheel was cocked all the way. Keep popping out of reverse. That's. I wonder if that's something I did. Yeah, that's definitely something I did. We'll worry about that later. It's running smoothly, I gotta say. All right. Something's st uh, stiff with the shift linkage. We'll worry about that later. Oh my God, it runs so much smoother now. I cannot put into words how much smoother it is running now. It's so much better. Immediately, I haven't even left my driveway yet. I'm, I'm a little excited. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> I got wheel spin first, second. Clutch doesn't feel any different. It really wasn't worn to begin with. Still smoking quite a bit, as I would kind of expect. Hasn't been running very long. Second, let's try third. There's third. In a minute, I'll try fourth, and we'll try freewheeling. This is so exciting. There's a guy. Fourth. Freewheeling works. <laughs> this runs so much better, and it hasn't backfired yet. I shouldn't say that out loud, but it hasn't. Let's try the windshield wipers. Pathetic as always, yes. Awesome. I'm sorry I didn't put up a second camera. Uh, I was too excited and impatient, so I didn't do that. Let's uh, flip a Yui here. Try to find first. It's idling pretty well. It's pretty good. It appears my approach of do everything right the first time on this engine rebuild has paid off, and it seems to be working. I am, uh-oh. I think I lost clutch. Yep, I'm pretty sure I lost the clutch. Why did I say that? The clutch is not there now. Feels like it just uh, popped off. Yeah, the clutch pedal is not connected to anything for sure. Uh, second is my uh, uh, gear of choice now. Put it in neutral, that's probably a bad idea. Awesome. Um, see if I can rev match. There we go. There's second clutchless gearbox now. I'm sure it's just the cable slipped off or something. <laughs> you port your bonds. <laughs> this is great. Uh, pop it into neutral. No, no, no. That's not. Oh, I hate free. I, oh, I hate doing this without free wheel. Let's just ram into the driveway. Okay, let's get up to the shop and then we'll just pop it out of neutral real quick like, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Aside from the clutch disappearing, this went well, rather well. Right, it's now several days later. I've had plenty of time to drive the Trevant around to give it a shakedown and then some, and it's working. I mean, I had to adjust almost nothing. The clutch cable slipped, I had to retighten that, and that was about it. It just sort of 
worked from the moment I put the engine in and turned it on. Now there are two little issues, like uh, the reverse, the, I have to hold the shift lever down while I'm in reverse, otherwise it'll pop out of gear. I don't know what happened there if I left a ball bearing out of the transmission or something. I'm not worried about that. And the second issue is I haven't set the idle properly yet, so it's too high. I'm not worried about that either. Normally I set my idle too high anyway because uh, it makes me less scared. So uh, the Trabal works now. I don't know what else to say. It's just great to have it back. And it's great to have it working. I can drive it around. I've made trips to Walmart in it already. Oh, I'm excited. Not quite as excited as when I first started up, but I am excited. I have a bit of a confession. Before starting on this engine rebuild project, I felt like a bit of a poser. I had a Trabant, which I talked about very often, to a very large number of people, but because of the poor running, starting, and all the backfiring issues I was having, I rarely drove it. In fact, I put maybe 50 miles on it per year, if that. Now though, I'll be driving the car a lot more. Shoot, the engine's only been in the car a couple days and I've already driven it at least 50 miles. I even took it to Walmart the other day, like it's an ordinary car albeit one made of cotton, very, very slow, and stands out absolutely everywhere. Bottom line, I won't feel like a poser anymore because now the Trabant is a usable car that I have been and will continue to use. What a novel concept. I'm, I'm very happy about this, if you can't tell. So that's it. The Trabant drivetrain rebuild project is now completed. Well, until the next thing breaks anyway. I'd like to take a moment now to extend some gratitudes to some people who have helped me along the way. I'd like to thank Ed from Budapest, Adam from Virginia, all of my hugely generous patrons at Patreon.com. I'd like to thank Tightreach for sponsoring part one of this series. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for watching and following along on this whole process and anyone who has supported me along the way. The Trabant lives again. I can drive it around like it's a somewhat normal car and it's thanks in no small part to the support from my audience. I might have been able to do this on my own, but it would have been substantially harder, taken substantially longer, and I just frankly wouldn't have been motivated if this was just a side project. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. You know what? I'm feeling frisky. Let's have, see how she does on the highway. Oh God, there's cars coming. <laughs> Second. Turn the blinker off. Hope for the best. Slight uphill grade here. It might struggle a bit. There's 60 kilometers an hour. Don't get too excited. Cars are fast approaching behind me. <laughs> Maybe this wasn't the best stretch of highway to do a 0-60 to 60 run. Any sort of uphill grade is just kind of... Nah. I'm still not in the fourth yet. It's kind of leveling off at 75 kilometers an hour. I'll get up to speed eventually. I just have to get past this hill. Let's go up to fourth anyway. Yeah. That made the speed drop a bit. I apologize to the people who are behind me. You can't hear me say any of this, but I apologize to them anyway. It's not like they see this car and expect it to go highway speeds, but uh, I feel like I'm holding them up nonetheless. We're about to reach the top of the hill. We're about to reach the top of the hill. We're about to reach the top of the hill. Oh, oh, oh we're almost up to 80 kph. All right. Flat level. Let's see if we can get it up to 100. I'm sure it can get up to 100. I've done it before already. Speeding up. There's a work zone up ahead and the speed limit drops down to 50 miles per hour. Let's see if we can hit 60 before that sign. Come on. 100 kilometers an hour. I'm going to keep going. Things are starting to smell a bit warm in here. 110 kilometers an hour. It's also a windy day. All of these things have a huge effect on the Chabot stop speed. <laughs> this feels wrong. All right, I'm going to start slowing down for this corner up here. The turn off, not a corner. I need to get some new brake drums because that's a substantial amount of vibration. Just for the front, I think. Maybe all, all the way around, I'm not sure. All right, <laughs> well, that was fun. Now to sit at a work zone. Goodbye.